only one of its kind, whether or not we are still subject to lockdown restrictions or whatever else. Uh, we've had one or two lectures already, and they've all been a great success where everybody around the world is here on screen at the same time. It's quite wonderful. Just glancing down the, the Zoom group chat, heavens, we have uh, California, London, Iowa, Jersey, Padova, Brighton, <laughs> Bersfield, Bersfeld, Norway, my goodness me, everywhere in the world, Germany, Richmond, Surrey, Oxford, Bournemouth, and somebody asking, when is it appropriate to begin drinking? A little patience, sir, <laughs> just a little, just a few we months of patience. We, we haven't uh, waited to be asked. <laughs> too late. <laughs> yeah, I'm wel welcoming everybody, and it is now the moment to propose a toast to Oscar. Every year at the Society's annual birthday dinner, we drink a toast to Oscar Wilde and our surroundings have strong Wildean connections. Nowadays, the National Liberal Club and before that, the Cadogan Hotel where he was arrested. Three or four years ago, Jonathan Fryer proposed a toast, a toast to Oscar and to Constance, at St. James's Church, Paddington, where they were married. And I remember he said that every time he came to St. James's Church, he could feel the presence of Oscar Wilde. I quote, spooky, as Dame Edna Everidge would say, although spooky in a most pleasant way. Jonathan said he's up there somewhere, among the rafters, looking down on us. But he's not alone, because half concealed behind one of the pillars, not hiding, but watching the proceedings with a wry smile on her face, is Constance. I think that's a nice thought. And I remember, too, the late Anne Clark Moore, who's very much missed, said that whenever she came to the birthday dinner at the Cadogan, she had an overwhelming feeling that the spirit of Oscar was present with us, and that it was the same for many of us. As she said, of course, it may be just imagination, evoked by the tragic events that took place here and heightened by the readings we've had of Oscar's wonderful poetry, so movingly rendered. But of one thing I am absolutely certain, Oscar Wilde is alive and well, for we love him and he lives on in all our hearts. In the strange isolation of this lockdown, many of us will have turned to the wild books, which we all have on our bookshelves. Very likely we have a collective <coughs> works and perhaps the letters. Some of us have shelves groaning under the weight, both physical and literary, of books by Oscar Wilde scholars who analyse these works word by word with deadly precision and write not about him, but about what others have said about him. But open Oscar's own works <laughs> or his letters just at random and you'll certainly find something amusing, thoughtful or surprising. Something to remind us of his wit and his charismatic personality and that he was an inspirational, wise, entertaining and wonderfully modern writer. So each of us here on the 166th anniversary of his birth, has the spirit of Oscar close at hand in our bookshelves at home. And this unites us with him. As Anne said, he is alive and well. We love him and he lives on in all our hearts. So please let us raise our glasses and join in a toast to Oscar Wilde. To Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde. Bless him. Yeah. Happy birthday, Oscar. Yeah. Oscar Wilde. Well, the, there, is no, there is no agenda for these proceedings. And um, I think uh, it's been suggested that um, some people might like to uh, perhaps read a favourite poem of, of Oscar's or of anybody else, or uh, uh, something to... Um, something... something about Oscar or by Oscar, which others might be interested to hear. 
So I think we'd be very happy to hear any contributions. I'll come up with one if nobody else volunteers too soon, so too quickly. To get a book. <laughs> Simone, are I you... wish I had anything short enough. All my <coughs> I've been giving her about 15 minutes, so I'll spare you all that silliness. I have something short that I might say if it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Dave, David Cronin here, Cape Cod, uh, Massachusetts. A new member of the society this year, by the way. Thank you for that. Uh, Welcome. I actually uh, create uh, pharmaceuticals and medical devices for my career, so I may not be the most prototypical uh, Wildian, but he is my favorite playwright. You have and, an interesting background there. <laughs> well, that's sometimes how I think that Oscar liked to live. Uh, he. He well, was kind of on his, He was going to go down one way or the other, but you know he did it with a salute and a smile. That's how I like to think of it. So when I heard about this event, it was going to be a Zoom event. It made me think of a line that I think goes back to him, where he said something like, "Let us have no machine-made ornament at all. It is all bad and worthless and ugly." And what I have to say is I'm not sure what he'd think about this. That we're using machine-made ornament, this high technology, this completely distant thing, but I think he'd get a kick out of it. So, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Could I contribute one of Oscar's letters? Not the whole of it, just a few bits of it. It's to uh, Robbie Ross. Oscar writing to him from Paris. Oscar wrote a lot of letters to Robbie Ross because Robbie never quite seemed to get Oscar's allowance to him quite as quickly <laughs> as Oscar would have liked. So he wrote uh, reminders and being Oscar, he, he added to those reminders just a charming narrative of what was happening to him. So this is just a few excerpts from one letter he wrote. He begins, my dear Robbie, I feel we are both premature. People who count their chickens before they're hatched act very wisely because chickens run about so absurdly that it's almost impossible to count them accurately. But the question of rooms is different. I fear you will have great trouble getting any promises of rooms. I don't wish to be horrible, but I think you're really unkind in saying that you cannot explain to people that the object of my taking unfurnished rooms is to enable me to have boys. Boys can be had anywhere. The difficulty I am under is my name, my personality. I might be practically turned out of furnished rooms at a moment's notice, but in unfurnished, I am my own master. I saw a delightful miracle play on Sunday in the Cartier Latin and dined with a lot of actors and four poets afterwards. They were most nice and sympathetic, and we were all very gay on Van Ordinaire. After all, the only proper intoxication is conversation. Where do you spend your summer? Is there any chance of you being in France? Condor says he's found a furnished house for me at 150 francs for three months. But I'm afraid of the river air. I hope to go to the sea. Rivers are very bad for me. I need air like strong wine. When I see Morris, I shall give him, as you ask, your undying love. And that despotism shall be untempered by epigrams. Robbie, I fear if I write any more, the weight of the ink will force you, or me, for all your ever yours, Oscar. That was the best. Beautiful, I would like to write to read a poem by Oscar, if I may. And I want to read that because, and I think it fits quite well, Don, to, to your letter, because I'm, I think as probably everyone else, I'm quite curious. So I'm delighted that there are all these letters we can read and all the other bits of information. But at the same, I'm not sure 
you know, these were not letters meant to be read by us, but but these were personal letters. So there's one poem by Oscar, which is yeah. called, called On the Sale by Auction of Keats Love Letters. Yeah. And I would like to read that because I, as I said, I'm be I'm ambivalent about, about these letters and all these other information. Um, and I thought that that's probably a quite, but it's a quite short poem, if I may. So these are the letters which Endymion wrote to one he loved in secret and apart. And now the brawlers of the auction mart bargain and bid for each bloat, poor blotted note, ah, for each separate pulse of fashion quote, merchant's price, I think they love not art, who break the crystal of a poet's heart that small and sickly eyes may glare and gloat. Is it not said that many years ago in a far eastern town some soldiers run with torches through the midnight and began to wrangle for the main Raymond, and to, and to throw dice for the garments of a wretched man, not knowing the God's wonders or his woe. Thank you. Okay. You read Savannah? I've got one if, if uh, nobody minds if I go next. Oh, I've got hot chocolate over my face. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so this is a, can everybody hear me all right? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I'm so paranoid that uh, my microphone doesn't work. So this is a toast that I wrote for the end of Absinthe and Oscar, which is what I was writing when uh, some of you met me for the first time uh, when I first joined the Oscar Wilde Society. So it was the end of, end of that longer lecture, it's about 45 minutes, but I won't read you the whole thing because uh, I'm rewriting it. Um, so this is at the end, I had discussed the end of Oscar's life. <clears throat> it is easy to linger here in that cheap Parisian hotel room with the bad wallpaper, the empty absinthe bottles, the figure of the dead wild, in this anguished extinguishing of such a bright star. But instead, let us think of wild star in its full glory, that life that is the grand work surrounding all the others, arranged just as carefully by its author. This life which delights readers and fascinates scholars, let us remember the love letters, the fairy tales, the cigarettes, the aphorisms, the green carnations, the gilded youth, the cutting wit, and yes, the absinthe. Let us raise our glasses to a life of art. I raise my glass not just to Wilde, but to all of you and to this. We who are drawn here by the fascination of the green fairy count among the ranks of great absinthe drinkers down the centuries. I leave you now with these words from Oscar Wilde's most famous hedonist, Lord Henry Wotton. Don't squander the gold of your days, listening to the tedious, trying to improve the hopeless failure of false ideals of our age. Live, live the wonderful life that is in you. Let nothing be lost upon you. Be always searching for new sensations and be afraid of nothing. Very Thank nice. You. Thank you. Hello, if I could have a moment. I'd just like to announce to everybody that our Wild Wit competition started today. I hope that you will all enter. The competition, as last year, is to come up with a phrase, or more than one if you like, um, that you think sounds like something Oscar himself might have said. As we all know, he has very a lot of very famous aphorisms, but there's a lot of things attributed to him that he never said. And we thought, well, why not give everybody in the society a chance to come up with something that Oscar Wilde never said, but that sounds like something he might have said. So you can enter, there's a link on our website. You can find it on our YouTube page. You can find it on, on our Facebook page. Um, so in that spirit, I'd like to tell you that uh, we already have some entries and I will just give you five that I like that came in today when we announced the competition. Um, the first one is, lest we forget, the early worm gets eaten. Uh, philosophy is the art of questioning the unquestionable to annoying effect. Here's a very patriotic one. Scotland needs England like a caber needs a tosser. <laughs> it takes a lot of planning to look this disorganized. 
And one, the final one I'll read to you, I came, I saw, I left early. <laughs> <laughs> Please enter the competition. Oh, that's a good start, I must say. Excellent. I've just popped the link in the chat if anyone's not seen it already. Thanks, Dan. Anyone else uh, like to say anything? Excuse me, I have something to display, not to say. Um, I've got a photograph to show you if you'd like. Um, it's a photograph of Oscar Wilde that um, I believe nobody here has seen before. Um, well, I know that two people have because um, on, the case on the next issue, but I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm going to hold it up to the camera. Can you see this? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, pretty nice. And all of us reflected back in it as well, which is funny. <laughs> it's just on my uh, smaller iPad at the moment, but you can see that? Is, is that <laughs> really clear? Yeah. It's, there's, a, there's quite a bit of glare on it here. Yeah, no, you can see it. Yeah. Looks very clear. Yeah, okay. And this photograph, um, I've, I've run this by Marilyn and Matthew Sturgis, we've discussed it. Um, I discovered this uh, in a newspaper recently, the Westminster Budget of 1893. And it featured um, an article about Salome not being shown on the London stage. And it showed a picture of Oscar before and after, the before picture being one of the Sarony photographs and the today picture being this one. And what it is, it's a photograph from the session or the sitting that Oscar took with uh, Downey, W uh, and D Downey, Ward Downey, uh, in 1899. So there are, um, I think, two other pictures from this series that you'd be very familiar with. Um, but Oscar looks slightly different in this picture because he's taken from the side and a, well, a little, uh, you know, so three quarter profile. And so if, therefore his face looks a little bit more rounded than you would think it would be in the, in the front on shots from the same session. So he actually looks a little bit older. And um, just let me pull that up again. So um, I was scrolling through the pages of the newspaper and it was one of those, um, uh, epiphany moments when you do a double take because everyone's familiar with almost every picture of Oscar and when you see one you haven't seen before my eyes nearly popped out of my eyes no. I thought well, I have to um, I have to look into this and uh, I asked Merlin Holland about it and of course you know he knew about it um, but only from about 30 years ago when it was um, it was discovered in a scrapbook at Chelsea Town Hall and he'd kept a photo of it um, rummaged away somewhere uh, but hadn't put it in the Wild Album he said because um, it was poor quality as is this one and um, so uh, he, he sort of knew about it but apart from Merlin having that copy I don't think this issue of the Westminster Budget which has only recently been digitised I believe was available. So I've got this and I'll share it in the next intentions or email newsletter. Yeah, jolly good. Oh, yeah, that's great. If anybody, if anybody wants a copy of that, I'll send it to them. So just email me at uh, info Oscar Wilde in America and I'll send you the best copy I have. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone, anyone else? Yes. I, yes. Uh, who? Uh, it's Gawain. Hello. In the, it's Gawain. It's gone dead. Hello, it's Gawain. The, it's here. Are you it's Gawain, hello. We've it's got Gawain. you now. It's, you've come through now. Hello, John. Hello, Gawain. Can you hear me? It's a long, why, I can indeed. Well, um, it's a long time since. It's a very long time. It's a very long time since we met Don. Um, here's, a, here's Nicky sitting here beside me. Ah, 
Because I, I, remember, if you can, <laughs> because I remember, as everybody will, you're one. I, I, I would like to. Um, I would like to say um, the dead poet. Um, as you know, I'm Bose's great nephew, so um, uh, I feel it would be rather an appropriate moment to to say the dead poet, which I've recited many times at the Oscar Wilde Society. Um, is that okay with everyone? Yes. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> um, when Wilde died, Bosey realised what a great friend he'd lost, what a great figure the world had lost. Yes. And, and he wrote perhaps his, his best poet, poem, the, the Dead Poet. Yeah. It's not only a great poem, but it, it's one of our best descriptions of Oscar Wilde's magical power with words. Are with you going to recite it for us now? Yes. Good. The Dead Poet by Alfred Douglas. I dreamed of him last night. I saw his face, all radiant, hallowed of distress. And as of old in music measureless, I heard his golden voice and marked him trace under the common thing, the hidden grace till mean things put on beauty like a dress, and all the world was an enchanted place. And then, methought, outside a fast locked gate, <coughs> I mourned the loss of unrecorded words, forgotten tales and mysteries half said, wonders that might have been <coughs> articulate, and voiceless thoughts like murdered singing birds. And so I woke and knew that he was dead. My dog was uh, trying to recite at the same time. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. He's an enthusiastic lover of poetry. I'm sorry if he interrupted. <laughs> you know Thank what you say? Very well. Children are animals. <laughs> <laughs> so, happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yes, happy birthday, Oscar. Thank you. Anyone else want to round us after half past eight before I stop recording? Can I, um, can you hear me? No. Can I interject if that's okay? Can you see me at the top? I hope that the uh, Wildian Society, Oscar Wild Society, is still planning its um, visit to Leighton House. Mm. Any, any response? Still planning? Are you still hoping to go at some stage? I know that it had to be postponed. <laughs> it had to be postponed yes. on this year, didn't it? I'm trying, to, trying to raise some morale here because uh, I don't want to get too maudlin, especially with the news all the time. Mm. I know you were planning to go to Leighton House. Now you have a really good excuse. Investing in the British newspaper archive is the best investment I've ever made. And yesterday, to my enormous surprise, I discovered that Lord Leighton's favourite model, Dorothy Dean, actually performed in A Woman of No Importance. Oh! In two nice. lines. The good guy, the good woman, and the bad woman. Oh! Ain't that fantastic? Yeah. yeah. So one of the things I would just say in, in, in praise of Oscar, we will never run out of opportunities to research his life. Yeah, yeah. That there is so much still more yeah, to find. And I was just so pleased. I found this amazing um, column where somebody had actually collated all the reviews for Dorothy Dean in A Woman of No Importance. Oh. They were glowing, you'll be pleased to know. And we've always thought that she was a bit of a ham, you know, not very good at all. So um, Robert and I, uh, many moons ago, went to Leighton House to see the play about Dorothy Dean. I really enjoyed it. I think he was a little shocked. She took her clothes off. Um, we didn't expect that sort of thing, you know, in a rarefied. <laughs> she was stark naked. Scott, my husband, who really enjoys stark naked women, was really disappointed that he didn't go. Because he thought it was going to not be a very good production. But anyway, there we are, Robert. Things things work out in a strange way. Uh, so yes. So and if I can follow if I can follow on from that. I've just been reading a little biography of Lewis yes, Waller. Please do.
I've just been reading a little biography of Lewis Waller, who was the original yeah. Sir Robert Chilton in An yes. Ideal Husband. And he produced it at the Haymarket Theatre, which he was renting from Herbert Beerbohm yeah. Tree while he was in America. And Oscar didn't think a great deal of his performance. He wasn't a great actor. He was extremely yeah. good looking, but he yeah. wasn't a great actor. And Oscar didn't want to offend yeah. him because he always liked to keep in with these good looking young actors. So <laughs> when he was asked about his interpretation yeah. of Sir Robert Chilton, he thought for a moment and said he would make a very good D'Artagnan. <laughs> <laughs> In, f in fact, this proved to be prophetic because a few years later, Lewis Waller yeah. had one of the biggest hits of his career in a stage version of The Three Musketeers, yeah. which he played for the rest of his life. Oh, oh, oh. Very good. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Brilliant. You'll have to send me that as I'm busy writing up Lewis Waller. And some of you might know, I do a lot of work at the Russell Coates, mm. where there is an eight foot high portrait of Lewis Waller uh, that I couldn't resist researching. And you and need to... An ego, I think, did Lewis Waller. And, and you need to get hold of... To it. You need to get hold of Hesketh, Pe Hesketh Pearson's book, The mm. Actor Managers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It, got, it yeah. has a very good yes. biography of him. It. Yeah, uh, for, yes, yeah, Grady, that, is K, that is K-O-W Waller. Mm. Yes, excellent. He had his own fan club, he was so pretty. Uh, they were called Keen on Waller. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. We've all been there. Who could, you couldn't beat the Victorian <laughs> theatre world, could you really? Oh. Wonderful anecdote. Absolutely. Anyway, when I've collated it all, It'll either go into the newsletter or intentions or the wild Ian. Right. So as Robert knows, he's already worked <laughs> with me on a huge article for the next wild Ian on uh, Wilds and Bose's exploits in Bournemouth, which we inevitably did <laughs> subtitle, um, you know, Bugger Bournemouth. <laughs> <laughs> the original, of course, was Bugger Bognor. Yes. <laughs> the original was Bugger Bob. Was <laughs> Edward the Seventh, was it? So the one good thing about lockdown is I'm writing an awful lot about the wild. Um, so keep at it, everybody. Uh, keep researching. I, I, I can uh, stick in with another poem if you're, if that's okay. Uh, whoever, I don't know who's chairing this, but anyway, uh, if that's okay. Um, <laughs> yes, go yeah. ahead. Okay. Go ahead now. Uh, well, the thing is, I've got to go off screen. Well, I've got to, I've got to go off screen because it's on uh, another section of my. So you can presumably see me and hear me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I can't yeah. see. Okay. Um, now the thing is, I have actually got to Vanessa to blame on this one because uh, she. I, I'm going completely off piste. Uh, because uh, uh, Vanessa suggested I, 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 I did something on Yates rather mm. than, than Oscar. Uh, right. Um, well, the reason for this is because quite a lot of the time, Ireland seems to get moved out of everything. And uh, I think uh, Mr. Murphy uh, of Dublin uh, would, would uh, hopefully would appreciate a mention for Ireland because after all, as he has so often, uh, he thinks that the Irish could get a, a reduction in the membership fee because they get us <laughs> Oscar. <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that. We'd have to pass over to whoever's uh, running the well, well, the treasurer, actually. Uh, however, I think um, I will try and make up for it by at least giving a poem by Yeats and something about Yeats and Wilde. Uh, now, firstly, my apologies. Um, I was born in Scotland. I spent some of my childhood in Wales. Um, I was educated in, in England. I worked for the Cordish Stage Company, and I've been a Londoner for decades which makes me the ideal person to pontificate about Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my only excuse is I first went to Ireland when I was 18 and fell totally in love with it. And it has been a romance that has lasted almost 60 years. And it was also a romance, of course, with its writers. I will not try to burden you with my attempts at an Irish accent. Ireland has suffered enough already. <laughs> <laughs> A quick rundown of the relationship between Wilde and Yeats. 
as a young man, W.B. Yeats attended Wilde's lecture in Dublin in November 1883. 1888, Wilde, thinking that Yeats might be lonely, invited him to have lunch at Tite Street. The youthful Yeats found himself intimidated by Wilde's savoir faire, his hard brilliance and dominating self possession, when contrasted with Yeats's own gaucheness. During the meal, Oscar told Yeats, We Irish are too poetical to be poets. We are a nation of brilliant failures, but we are the greatest talkers since the Greeks. <laughs> Oscar's observations considering his guest's future career. <laughs> Yeats recalled, I remember thinking that the perfect harmony of his life with his beautiful wife and, two, uh, and his two young children suggested some deliberate composition. Yeats did not particularly admire Oscar's writing, but saw him instead as a man of action. It was a man I admired who was to show so much courage and who was so loyal to the intellect. Uruguay, he regarded Wilde as one of our 18th century duelists, born in the wrong century. He would be a good leader in a cavalry charge. Oscar yes. told me that he had turned down a safe seat in Parliament. Yeats thought that if he had taken this course, his career might well have followed that of Disraeli, whose early style, quote, whose early style resembles his, being meant for crowds, for excitement, for hurried decisions, for immediate triumphs. Oscar, however, wrote in the ideal husband that only people who look dull ever get into the House of Commons. And only people who are dull ever succeed there. Yates was asked if he thought that Oscar was a snob and replied, no, I would not say that. England is a strict country for the Irish. To Wilde, the aristocrats of England were like the nobles of Baghdad. Yates also said that Oscar hated Bohemia and was vastly happier when staying at the homes of the rich. During Wilde's trials, Yeats, at his father's prompting, visited Oscar and delivered some letters of support from various liter Irish literati. He also attended court, but thereafter did not see Oscar again. Yeats wrote that the fall of Wilde endangered many of his friends. He himself had had to take care on the streets to avoid being beaten up. Yeats said that the rage of the mob against Wilde was really the rage of the British against art and artists. Yeats noted that the end of the decadence coincided with Wilde's death and the turn of the century, and said, in 1900, everyone got off down their uh, off their stilts. Henceforth, nobody drank absinthe with his black coffee. Nobody went mad. Nobody committed suicide. Nobody joined the Catholic Church. Or if they did, I have forgotten. <laughs> now, this is one of Yeats's greatest poems. Yes. I once heard Tom Clancy of the Clancy Brothers reciting it in Dublin in 1967. It was one of the unforgettable moments. It's called The Host of the Air. O'Driscoll drove with a song, the wild duck and the drake, from the tall and the tif tufted reeds at the drear heart lake. And he saw how the reeds grew dark at the coming of night tide and dreamed of the long dim hair. He heard while he sang and dreamed a piper piping away. And never was piping so sad, and never was piping so gay. And he saw young men and young girls who danced on a level place, and Bridget, his bride among them, with a sad and a gay face. The dancers crowded about him, and many a sweet thing said. And a young man brought him red wine, and a young girl white bread. But Bridget drew him by the sleeve, away from the merry bands, to old men playing at cards with a twinkling of ancient hands. The bread and the wine had a doom. These were the hosts of the air. He sat and played in a dream of a long dim air. He played with the merry old men and thought not of evil chance. The one bore Bridget his bride away from the merry dance. He bore her away in his arms, the handsomest young man there, and his neck and his breast and his arms were drowned in her long, dim hair. O'Driscoll scattered the cards, and out of his dream awoke. Old men and young men and young girls were gone like a drifting smoke. But he heard, high up in the air, a piper piping away. And never was piping so sad. And never was piping so gay. 
Okay, thanks, right. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, and beautifully you. read, that's lovely. Sorry, I've gone off screen. 